coming up on Theater Talk. Here's the thing about doing love letters, though. Every great actor can do it, uh, and they read the letters, so you don't you don't have to memorize it, or do you memorize it? This is what I want to know. Do you memorize it? Uh, so far, not. <laughs> but Nathan said to me, what kind of a job is that? You walk out, sit down, and read the damn thing? <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Would you consider coming to the Yale Dartmouth game Saturday, October 28th? I'll be there. Damn. I'm sorry, Melissa, I have to cancel. My parents have decided to visit that weekend and they come first, according to them. My mother says she'd love to have you with us, but my father thinks you can be somewhat distracting. You and your parents. Let me know when you decide to grow up. How about the Harvard game, November 16th? Do you plan to grow up at the Harvard game? <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, you know, Susan, one of the very first plays I saw when I got out of college and started at uh, Little Theater Week magazine uh, was a beautiful, beautiful play called Love Letters by A.R. Gurney. It was up at the Promenade Theater in about 1989, I think it was. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Pete, it was on a Monday night when you had another play running at the same time, uh, your great play, The, 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 the Cocktail Hour. Exactly true. Exactly yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's always been a, a, a play that I've admired very much. It's a very straightforward, simple idea. A man and a woman who have a very intense relationship over a long period of time, just reading their letters to each other, their diaries, their poems to each other. Um, it maps out a relationship between two people who love each other but can never actually be together in some ways. Yeah. Is that a fairly good description of your play, Pete? Well, it's written about a letter-writing culture. Yeah. Everybody had to communicate much more with letters and not by typewriter or computer, with penmanship. Yes. And with the cursive style. So you, a lot of yourself went into these letters when you write a girl or your parents or your grandmother when you're looking for a job. And, and uh, I think I tried to work with the, sort of the, the essential elements of that kind of letter, which really isn't written at all anymore. Yeah. Now we should say, uh, you're here with this old friend of ours. Mm -hmm. uh, the <laughs> old friend. <laughs> I had to say old. <laughs> The legend, the legendary, yeah, shall we? Is that better, Brian? The legendary. The legendary yeah. Like the Minotaur. Yeah. Brian Dennehy, who's one of our favorite guests of all time on uh, Theater Talk. And Brian is now on Broadway doing uh, the revival of Pete Gurney's uh, Love Letters at the Brooks Atkinson Theater. Yes, because uh, Pete, we should say that you're the famous playwright A.R. Gurney. Oh, yes, thank you for saying that. But everyone that. calls you Pete, though, right? Yeah, you, well, everybody there calls me Pete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But it's a, it's a superb production, and Brian is just brilliant in the play with um, Mia Farrow, who, as good as you are, Brian, i got to tell you, I mean, Mia Farrow is real... More attractive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, Brian, from my perspective, but I would say that I had forgotten what an uh, incredible actress She's an Mia Farrow is. She and is an amazing, amazing person, performer. and it's just... Uh, it's wonderful to go to work with her. She's just great. great. Now, here's the thing about doing love letters, though. Um, I mean, it's been done all over the world. It's, it's got to be, yeah. like, your biggest earner, if you Yeah, know. it's playing right now in France uh, with Anouk Aimé and Gerard Depardieu. Oh, wow. how fabulous. <laughs> oh, my God. Because every great actor can do it, uh, and they read the letters, so you don't... You don't have to memorize it, or do yeah. you memorize it? This is what I want to know. Do you memorize it? Uh, so far, not. <laughs> but Nathan said to me, what kind of a job is that? You walk out, sit down, and read the damn thing? <laughs> <laughs> Punished for that. <laughs> so that's a great piece of theater. Do you want the actors to memorize it, or do you want them? No, I think it's better when they don't. I, I, th I think it's better when you have the sense, and the good ones are, do this, of both reading, but they're reading what they have written. So right. they're immersing themselves in their own writing. And uh, so they're not just spouting, reciting, mm -hmm. they're acting. And, and that's what makes it work, I think. Is it a tricky thing to do to, 
to read and act you, at the same you, time. Uh, <laughs> you do glance. I glance down uh, to make sure that I'm right where, where, right where I want to be, and, and you kind of get the rhythm of mm -hmm. it. But, and there are phrases, obviously, which, you, which stick in your head. But I think it's important not to learn it, not to really work at it, you know, let it happen. And uh, I'm, I, I love it. I just absolutely love it. It's just, the, uh, he, he's such an uptight jerk in many ways, and yet at the end he kind of redeems himself. He becomes human, yeah. Yeah, he becomes mm -hmm. a human being, with too late, of course. You are playing this uh, patrician yeah, no, wasp guy. All this the, is unlike a part that I have seen. All the before. critics have said uh, <laughs> the most inappropriate actor ever to play a, a kind of a... Be in an air gurney play <laughs> <of> Brian Denny. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, what's I try to work over that. <laughs> yeah, like, what's his name? I think of Chadworth Osborne Jr., but what's his name? Andrew Makepeace Lad yes. yes. the Third. Yes. <laughs> Did he, you ever think you'd be playing I, a part called Andrew Makepeace Lad the Third? My, well, my Irish grandfather is revolving in his... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But now, what, I'm, I'm trying to think about what you just said, that he redeems himself. Because he really, he gives her, well, he does, but he gives her a bad time. I mean, that is, a, that is an important part of this play. See, that woman, guess, has a bad time. He has manipulated her for a long time. Uh, obviously, I look at it differently. Yes. I mean, he doesn't act well, obviously, in the relationship. At the same time, <clears throat> he... Um, he makes, he makes enormous sacrifices. I mean, the j whole Japan in incident, which is really interesting because it's... That's a, your silence. That's It's fabulous. a mystery uh, yeah. as to what happens to her. There. Something happens to her. Mm. Well, how does he make the sacrifice? When he comes back, when he comes back, he has <clears throat> not only excised himself from whatever happened there, but he's made a commitment now to live the life that his father... To be a good patrician man. ...wanted yeah. him to live. Mm. Having done that, it puts her in a position with regard to him that, uh, you know, first of all, she's married when he comes back, and that's a whole different story. But how many Americans have been in that dilemma where they realize that they're in love with someone, but they are married, and they have kids, and they have a whole structure of their life, and it's a very difficult thing to... Uh, to you know, just casually remove yourself from that. But so not, it's, it's not such a villain. All mm -hmm. right. Our associate here, Myra, went with me, and after it was over, she said to me, this makes me so mad about what mad. that woman had to deal with. <laughs> and what, were you, at the time, because now you look at it and say, a woman of that class, even though we won't say your character was a villain, mm -hmm. the, the, she, she had requirements of her life. She, she had constraints in her life that you did not have. And so it, she has a much more difficult time than you do. Were you recognizing this when you wrote it? No. No. You're Not, just saying what it was. But, but I do want to defend him, too. I, I, he gives her a kind of anchor in life. Yes. And that sounds heavy, and it, it's a, it drags her. But, on the, but it keeps her from going off in all weird directions. And when she's in real trouble, mm -hmm. he keeps saying, stick to your work, true, stick to true. your art. You're a terrific artist. And don't let that go. And, and, and you have the feeling that she could have been a really important artist. It, it would be interesting, for example, to conjecture or to write <clears throat> them being together. Yes. And how long would it last? Yes. And what would happen? Yeah. And where would the alcoholism, alcoholism and the self-destructiveness lead to? Well, it, might be two, it might be two or three lives wrecked. The you idea. know, one has to assume that, for example, he thought about it. He mm -hmm. thought ah. about it. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's, a, he's a thinking man. He's, he's a reflective man. It's but not I, something I, he hasn't casually disposed of. He's thought about it. And I'm she does to, give something to him that he... Can't get anywhere else. He can't get anywhere can't else, get anywhere else else. and he loves. Yeah. And he knows that, but he's willing to sacrifice that for this other thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then she has to sacrifice. Well, we go on. I'm just trying to convey the complexity of this play. That You're a really feminist. Doesn't. Exactly it's right. Precisely. Time. You're trying to strike a blow. Oh, yeah, it's always the, the man's <laughs> fault. The man went in her life. She would have been a great artist. It's and a reflection. Satisfying. And this is a complex play, Susan, which cannot be reduced to your <laughs> feminist nonsense that you learned at Smith. Or Vassar, wherever Sarah Lawrence. Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> where, did the, where did the play, um, where did it come from? I mean, is it based on people you knew? Oh, it, it, I, it's strange. I mean, it, it, the genesis of any play is strange. But in this particular case, I, I want, always wanted to write plays. I was writing plays. I was also teaching at MIT at that time. 
And my father-in-law said, you know, you, you should learn how to use a computer. Uh, there's this new thing called a computer, a word processor, I think it was. <laughs> And I said, I can't, <laughs> I can't even use an electric typewriter. I said, <clears throat> the, the electric typewriter makes that, hmm, that kind of, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and, and so so I, I said, uh, but he, he said, I'm going to give you this Radio Shack computer, which I no longer want. He said, I'm going to give it and just play with it. So I started by writing letters because <laughs> I could learn margins that way. And letters are short. And I wrote First, I wrote people I know. Here I am on a computer. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then I just started writing these letters, and suddenly I said, a story began to emerge, mm. and uh, and I realized I could have a, a man and a woman, and the world that I was saying goodbye to, right. which was the world of the, of the Parker Piffer Fifty One, and right. Right. Uh, sort of informed that the, the click of the computer was so different from the scratch of the pen. Hmm. So I, it, then it almost wrote itself. Really? Once I, once I realized it was going. Did you ever go back to any collection of your own letters or fans? Never, letters? never. Everything is just but, your but, imagination, two people talking to each but other? But I didn't imagine it that way. I mean, it was, I, I, I thought I had written an epistolary novel. Yes. Yeah. So I sent it into the New Yorker. And that it came right back the same. <laughs> we don't publish plays, and so then I I showed it to my agent Gilbert Parker, and I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "Well, try it as a play." So I had to give a lecture to a group at the library, and I got Holland Taylor. I sent it to her. I said, "Do you want to come? Wonderful actor. Want to come east and and read this with me?" So you and were that, the first person to play. Uh, absolutely, and I and. When I played him, he was a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I love that. Uh, listen, since I have uh, two uh, legends, if you mm -hmm. will, from the theater, uh, I'd like to just talk about your, your, your lives mm -hmm. in the theater, if we can. If I'm not mistaken, Brian, a conversation we had years ago that always sticks in my mind, were you not driving a meat truck or you were... <laughs> Among many things. You were, uh, you, you were like, delivering meat and you stopped... I, I, was, uh, I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, for almost five years. I got out of the Marine Corps. By that time, I had collected a wife and two kids, which were a hell of a lot cheaper in the Marine Corps than out of the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> I got a great job, actually, driving a meat truck, because in those days, which is the mid-60s, I'm guessing, uh, that job, which was so hard and so <laughs> difficult and so physical, paid a lot of money. Yeah. And I would start at four in the morning, and I'd work till noon or one or two in the afternoon, and... Uh, stay in shape doing it, although God knows it was a tough job, and make four or five hundred bucks a week, which is a lot of money in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, give me time to pursue this other thing, this ridiculous... My, my father said to me one time, why in the world would you want to be an actor? <laughs> I said, because I think it would make me happy. And he said, well, what the hell has that got to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a generational yeah. right? Yeah. Right. I go to the Wednesday matinees in my... <laughs> with, with your apron, with the... With, the well, no, not with the, the apron, but I had a zipper jacket that I would try to conceal. Uh, and this, I gave off, I emanated strange odors. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the Wednesday matinee ladies from New Jersey would always look at me as if to say, my God, will we get out of here alive? <laughs> going to explode? Because I had these boots on that were really soaked with stuff. But I saw, I, you know, I saw, I, I, the, the stuff that I saw was, you know, I, I remember seeing uh, Olivia do uh, Entertainer. Oh, wow. Oh. And I said, I don't know what the hell he's doing, but boy, that's what, that's what I'd like to do. I mean, I always had this kind of, I had a wonderful teacher in high school who thought that, as a football player, I'd make a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> Still parsing out the meaning. Of the statement. And for you, Pete, growing up uh, in Buffalo, we're both Buffalo boys. Yeah. Of course, we went to a lot of movies all the time, yeah. but yeah. also there were a lot of theaters. Yeah. There, and there were what, what we called then a community theater, you know, yeah. where, where they really, they did O'Neill, they did everything, but your mother might be playing Mary Tyrone if that, <laughs> if that had been published then, which it was. That would have been scary yeah, as yeah, hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it, 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 but 
so there were, and the schools were always putting on plays. So there were a lot of plays to go to. My parents loved the theater and they'd come down to New York and then come back and tell us what they'd seen. Did they bring the playbills back to you? They, well, sometimes, yeah, and because we had the Erlanger Theater right, where right. the Lunts would always come there and Catherine Cornell would always open her plays yep. there. And um, I, my father took me to, uh, I, I'll never forget it, to Othello with Paul Robeson, Uta Hagen, and Jose Ferrer. Wow. Oh, well, I, I think I was- In Buffalo? In Buffalo, and I was about 10. And she was sleeping with both of them, I think, at the time, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that much. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a vivid memory you have of that. Oh, God. My father used to imitate Paul Robeson when I was doing something. He'd say, ha, I like not that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So it was a scary experience for me, frankly. When did you start writing? I've always tried to write, I don't know why, what is it about me or my family? I, I, even as a, we had to write a lot of compositions, even when we were young, and I'd always raise my puny little hand and say, could I write a play? And then if they said yes, then I'd always want to read it in front of the class and get some laughs. <laughs> so I was always doing that. Is there an actor in you at all? I mean, did you ever want to be? Ter a terrible actor. <laughs> I've tried it, but I'm terrible. <laughs> there, there's a speech in this uh, where he talks about that generation, mm -hmm. what they did not give us, but they also said, but they did give us one thing, mm -hmm. the need to write, mm -hmm. the requirement to write, to uh, organize your thoughts, to sit down and to actually write a letter to someone else. And it's probably very much reflective of what we're talking about it right now. Right. This play is a celebration of language in I, I, in many ways. I think Absolutely. so, and I and I, I sometimes wonder why today it seems to work so well with audiences. And I think partly because this audience, most people in, are tweeting and sort of using short shorthand and everything, and they see a a, a whole system of communication where good grammar, the, the verb is in the right place. I think that they see that there's another way to communicate besides just this rapid and slightly superficial way of communicating mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, by writing letters. Just the other day I was uh, going through some old files and I found, I'd forgotten I had this, um, all of the letters that my grandmother wrote to me when I was in college, wow. but all written like that. And I, I looked at those letters and I thought, this. This is my. This is what is left of my grandmother. Sure. And you will never have that in this day and age again. No. Because no. you're never going to be able to do a printout of an email and say, "Oh, this is. No. This was Pete Gurney. This was yeah. Michael Riedel. It's, yeah. I mean, her handwriting was there. And I bet you, I mean, not everybody. There, everybody's penmanship wasn't wonderful, but most people tried to make it at least distinctive. Yes, and also you yeah. can see a mind at work because you can see. Um, a word crossed out and another word right. chosen, yeah. which tells you the, whatever she was writing to me, she really was thinking about. That's right. This is not the right word. This is the better word. That's right. Yeah. And it's not deleted. It's there. It's yeah. crossed out. But you can see this is what she wanted to say. Then she thought of a better way of saying it. Yeah. Well, that's that's gone. I'm that's afraid. gone. <laughs> All right. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I do want to ask you, um, you've seen a lot of great plays and great performances in your lives. Of all the ones you've seen, Brian, aside from your own, anyone that sticks out in your mind, <laughs> something that's, that... that's a hard, hard one to to add, add to. I mean, all of the Brits were always impressive to me. Uh, Americans have are suckers for yeah. those yes, guys, yeah. Gilgood and Olivier, and uh, you saw them on stage. Well, you saw Olivier. I saw them yeah. on stage, yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, love them all. Richardson was my favorite, I think, but really. What'd you see? I, it was the Pinter. I think I saw it in London. Oh, No Man's Land. No Man's yeah, No Man's yeah. Land, which yeah. was wonderful. I have no idea what it meant, <laughs> but it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. And the two of them were just so extraordinary together. It was Richardson and Gilgood, right? Richardson yeah. and Gilgood. And Richardson half knew his lines, which somehow made it better. <laughs> and uh, he was stop. I said, Line, <laughs> <laughs> which could, we, which is in a way see, a pinter play because it's yeah. it's it's and, a. It's and you a, can see Gilgood wanting to say line himself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> give him the goddamn line. <laughs> but I I loved all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, those guys, I just I was always crazy for that. 
<laughs> I'd have to say the best um, American stage actor for me was Jason, of course. Robards, yeah. Mm. And probably the experience that I remember most vividly was Moon for the Misbegotten that he did with Colleen. With Colleen, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Eddie Flanders, who was wonderful. Eddie Flanders, oh. yeah. And Fl Flanders I got to know later on, and he and I were poisonously alcoholic in those days, and, <laughs> and we pushed each other down a road that we should not have gone down, but it was always fun to be with him. Crazy, <laughs> wonderful character. And, and you, Pete, I mean, any of all the great performances you must have seen? I, I was talking earlier to Brian, I think I was ushering in the Schubert Theater, and when I was at the Yale School of Drama. Up in New Haven. In New Haven. Yeah. Still and, there. Yep. And O'Neill's Long Day's Journey into Night opened. And, and we had been reading a book called Trying to Like O'Neill. And, and O'Neill was reading, not very popular at the drama school. I saw this play. I, I'll never forget it. I, I'm sure we could all cast it better, maybe not. But I just thought that was the most moving thing I'd ever seen. So I became a great... O'Neill Who was in freak. it? Who was in the production that you saw? Frederick March. Yeah. Frederick March's wife, whose name was... Lawrence, Lawrence, Eldridge. Lawrence Eldridge. Lawrence Eldridge. Oh, this was the original. Jason yeah. and Brad Brad Dillon. Dillon. Brad Dillon. Yeah. She insisted on being in it, <clears throat> in fact. <clears throat> <laughs> because she, she didn't trust Frederick in New York on his own. Uh, <laughs> was she was she not very good? Or was I, it? I thought she was fabulous. I, I I've then seen better. Yeah. Mary uh, Mary Tyrone. Well, uh, and the, and, the, and Brian yours. and Vanessa. That's right. I didn't great. see that production. Oh, no, you missed that. Was great. I, I I don't know where we were, but, but, but I didn't see it, and I wish I had. Mia Farrow. Yes. Could be a great Mary Tarot. Mary yeah. You are right. You are I right. couldn't agree with you more. I mean, uh, and Brian, you suggested the same thing. I mean, she's fantastic. Well, it, well, there's a reason why in, in the play those three men love her to distraction. In mm -hmm. Long Day's Journey, yeah. In Long Day's Journey. The, and the thing about Mia is it's hard not to love her. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. You fall in love with her, whatever your relationship is with her. And that's critical in that. Having done it with Vanessa, <laughs> you know, I mean, you do love your drill sergeant when you're in the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> Only in a very kind of funny way, you know. <laughs> who, but, would you, uh, who would you put as James Tyrone opposite Mia Farrow in your dream production with Mia as Mary Tyrone? Besides me? Yeah, yeah <laughs> of course. <laughs> would you do it again? Would you do it? Would yeah, you? I'm, I'm too old for it now. But uh, uh, that's, a, that's a terrible thing to have to say about yourself. <laughs> too old to play James Tyrone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you are. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. But who would you put opposite? Her? I don't know. That's a good. It's a. It's. I mean, you think of all the great matinee idols who could also act. Um, you know, it, uh, but that's a question I have to think about. Yeah, you have to ponder that now. It's kind of. Well, you want it to be the right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be opposite her, and then want the, and you want the boys to be right. You know. And, and, you had Philip Seymour Hoffman. Well, I'll tell you something. The best Jamie I ever saw was yeah. Jason. Oh, I agree. Before we go, I, I wanted to say we, we're singing the praises of Mia Farrow, but by the time this interview airs, she's not in it anymore. Carol Burnett is Carol in it Burnett, with you. Whom I've done it with, and who is dynamite. Very different. Very different from Mia Farrow. And then you're going to have this revolving cast of celebrities. Right. you got uh, my friend Angelica Houston, my co-star from Smash. Mm -hmm. uh, Angel I, I could do it with Angelica if... Uh, if, if uh, the part is yours. Thank you very much. <laughs> Susan and I, we can do it on a oh, Monday night. Oh, knock <laughs> Love out. Letters. Knock out. And then right. Diana Rigg is coming. You Candace go. Bergen. Candace Bergen and Alan Alda do it too. You know, oh, it's, wonderful. We've mentioned right. all the women. <laughs> well, as far as we're concerned, there's only one man who can do this part properly. And, the, and the, the woman mentioned all the women, by the way. <laughs> it's Brian Dennehy with a cast of fabulous actresses in Love Letters. He's going to do it with me. <laughs> could you ever do it? Uh, you no, know, you could never do two, two guys, right? Has, it ever, has anyone ever wanted to do That's it? That's a very interesting. Has anyone ever wanted to do it with two My guys? wife, yeah. uh, Jennifer, said, I wonder what it would look like if it were two guys. Have you ever had a request for so, it? Yes, that, yes, I have, and fairly <laughs> recently. Yeah. Uh, what happened was there's a, you probably know, there's a TV f movie that's just been made with Sam Waterston, Jane Fonda, uh, Lily Tomlin, right. and um, Martin Sheen. Oh. Martin Sheen, yeah, yeah. And I got an email from Sam saying that we, the, the plot is these two older guys run off together mm -hmm. 
and leave their wives behind. He said, would you let us do love letters one night? Just Martin and I playing <laughs> these parts. And, and I said, no. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> but I, but, but I did let, I did let Mazel. Charles Mazel. Bush. Yeah, yeah Charles yeah. Bush. And I didn't see it, but I hear he was terrific. He did it with Jim Dale. And oh, I hear he was terrific. Right. But he did it as a woman. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I said he talked. Oh, he did it in drag. He did. He, yeah, he did it in drag. He oh. didn't. He didn't do it as a man. He played the woman. I said that's the only way to do it. And, right. And uh, oh, I see. Brian Dennehy and Dame <laughs> Edna. <laughs> yeah, love yeah, letters. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be interesting. All right. Don't miss love letters at the Brooks Atkinson Theater, written by A. R. Gurney, starring Brian Dennehy. Thanks a lot for being our guest. Thank you. For the presence. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you, and good night.